Real Images of What NASA Discovered on Mercury Let's start out with some of the more recent news for Mercury, shall we? On October 1, 2021, the Joint European Space Agency ESA and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency JAXA, Bepi Colombo spacecraft successfully performed its first flyby of the solar system's innermost planet Mercury. The flyby is the first in a set of six such events Bepi Colombo will complete before entering orbit around Mercury in late 2025. The three monitoring cameras on board Bepi Colombo's Mercury Transfer Module MTM, captured images of the planet for four hours beginning approximately five minutes after the closest approach. While this may not seem as vital given that the satellite is going to be in orbit around Mercury in 2025, these flybys are needed because once the orbit is had, some areas of Mercury will not be visible to the craft. So thus, these flybys are the best way of getting a look at some spots of Mercury, like with certain impact craters, in order to study them further. The flyby was flawless from the spacecraft point of view, and it's incredible to finally see our target planet," said Elsa Montagon, spacecraft operations manager for Bepi Colombo. As the flyby progressed, several instruments on board Bepi Colombo's modules simultaneously collected data on Mercury and its surrounding environment. It may have been a fleeting flyby, but for some of Bepi Colombo's instruments, it marked the beginning of their science data collection and a chance to really start preparing for the main mission, says Johannes Benkoff, Bepi Colombo project scientist at ESA. These flybys also offer the chance to sample regions around Mercury that will not be accessible once we're in orbit. During the flyby, the Phoebus Ultraviolet Spectrometer on Bepi Colombo's Mercury Planet Orbiter MPO, module collected data on Mercury's exosphere, an extremely thin, low-density atmosphere. Currently, the exosphere is thought to exist due to either solar wind or surface material. Phoebus observed the region for an hour. After Bepi Colombo exited from the shadow of Mercury, Phoebus recorded sharp peaks of hydrogen and calcium following close approach. These two elements are thought to be common in Mercury's exosphere. What's more, the Mercury Gamma Ray and Neutron Spectrometer MGNS, instrument, also located on the MPO, detected bright fluxes of neutron and gamma rays in the exosphere, phenomena often produced by galactic cosmic rays interacting with the uppermost surface layers of a planet. Additionally, these emissions could provide insight into the composition of the surface of Mercury. This is good because while we have had craft go by and scan the planet in their own way via sensors and pictures, we haven't landed anything on Mercury, so its surface is not as detailed as we want it to be. Obviously, once the satellite takes orbit around 2025, it'll go into more detail and do its best to further elaborate on what it's been sensing in the exosphere and on the planet itself. But until then, at least we have some looks at the planet to start making inferences on. Due to Mercury's close proximity to the Sun, one might expect the planet to be often blasted with solar wind that is ejected from the Sun's corona. However, Mercury's magnetic field, like Earth, helps shield the planet from the full force of coronal ejections. Until Bepi Colombo's flyby, only the Northern Hemisphere had been magnetically surveyed by a spacecraft, leaving scientists without an answer to how the planet's magnetic field and solar wind interacted at Mercury's Southern Hemisphere. During Bepi Colombo's flyby, sensors located on the spacecraft's magnetometer boom recorded data on Mercury's magnetic field and solar wind as the craft zipped past the planet's southern hemisphere. That makes this flyby particularly interesting, as it is the first time that data from the planet's southern hemisphere close to the surface is available, even if it is just a small sample," said Daniel Hainer from TU Braunschweig in Germany, MPO Magnetometer Researcher Group lead. Bepi Colombo teams took the magnetometer data and converted it into a sound audible to the human ear. The audio captures the changes in the intensity of the magnetic field in solar wind, as well as the moment Bepi Colombo crossed the magneto sheath, the border region around Mercury where the planet's magnetosphere and solar wind interact in a highly turbulent way. This only makes the eventual entry into orbit all the more desirable, because once the craft is locked in orbit, It'll not just be able to examine the magnetosphere, but also be able to go and examine the actual interior of the planet and see how that is all going. Because wouldn't that be a twist if there was something truly shocking going on inside of Mercury and we just didn't know it yet? We can't say it's not a possibility because 
we honestly don't know about its interior. Before we continue on with Mercury, be sure to like or dislike the video. That way we can continue to give the best content possible to you, the viewer. Also be sure to subscribe to the channel. And now, back to Mercury. Beppe Colombo's Italian Spring Accelerometer ISA instrument, located on the MPO module, recorded the spacecraft's accelerations as Mercury's gravitational pull tugged on the craft. The ISA also recorded the temperature change Beppe Colombo experienced as it entered and exited the shadow of Mercury. These measurements are similar to those taken by the ISA in August as the mission performed its second Venus flyby. Like the magnetometer data, the Beppe Colombo team was able to translate the ISA data into an audio file. On the acceleration plots that were appearing on our screens, we could see the tidal effects of Mercury on the Beppe Colombo structure and drop of the solar radiation pressure during the transit in the shadow of the planet and the movement of the center of mass of the spacecraft due to flexing of the large solar arrays," says Carmelo Magnifico of the Italian National Institute for Astrophysics. In orbit, the ISA will support a study of Mercury's interior structure and will test Einstein's theory of general relativity with great accuracy. The instrument will also measure Mercury's center of mass as it completes its 88-day orbit around the Sun. Additionally, the ISA will be used to provide accurate details on the orbit of the MPO component of the mission, so as you can see, a single flyby was able to get a lot of information for a lot of people. So when is the next flyby for the craft going to happen? Sadly, that won't be until the middle of 2022, but if it's even half as good and successful as the first flyby, then there's a lot more data to be had here, and that could further expand what we already know about Mercury. And needless to say, the teams are excited about what will happen next. We're really looking forward to seeing the first results from measurements taken so close to Mercury's surface," said Johannes Benkoff, ESA's Beppe Colombo project scientist in a statement. When I started working as project scientist on Beppe Colombo in January of 2008, NASA's Messenger mission had its first flyby at Mercury. Now it's our turn. It's a fantastic feeling. A fantastic feeling indeed for those involved in the project as it shows how far we've come in regards to both observing and recording things about Mercury. The earliest known recorded observations of Mercury are from the Mull Apen tablets. These observations were most likely made by an Assyrian astronomer around the 14th century BC. The Kenyan form name used to designate Mercury on the Mull Apen tablets is translated as the jumping planet. Babylonian records of Mercury date back to the first millennium BC. The Babylonians called the planet Nabu after the messenger of the gods in their mythology, which is ironic because Mercury is the name of the messenger god to the Roman pantheon. Many other civilizations found out about Mercury in their own ways, including the ancient Greeks, Romans, Chinese, and even the Maya. The first telescopic observations of Mercury were made by Galileo in the early 17th century, although he observed phases when he looked at Venus. His telescope was not powerful enough to see the phases of Mercury. In 1631, Pierre Gassendi made the first telescopic observations of the transit of a planet across the Sun when he saw a transit of Mercury predicted by Johannes Kepler. In 1639, Giovanni Zuppi used a telescope to discover that the planet had orbital phases similar to Venus and the Moon. The observation demonstrated conclusively that Mercury orbited around the Sun. In the 1880s, Giovanni Schiaparelli mapped the planet more accurately and even perfectly detailed its orbital time around the Sun. As more time went on, more time was devoted to studying Mercury, including in the 1970s when NASA launched the first craft to Mercury via the Mariner 10. After that came the Messenger and then the craft we just talked about. So we've been trying to observe Mercury for some time as you can see. Mercury is a very interesting planet in a whole host of ways but not the least of which is because of the fact that it is indeed the closest planet to the Sun. Because of this, it has certain perks as well as disadvantages. First and foremost, it's the closest planet to the Sun because it's only 29 million miles from the Sun at its closest. Now, yes, I'm sure that this seems like a long distance, but when you're talking about the Sun, a Sun that is 860,000 miles in diameter, that's not as far as you think. And because of that distance, a lot of things have happened to Mercury over the years. For example, one look at older new shots of Mercury, and you'll see that not only is it barren, 
it's absolutely peppered with craters from objects crashing into it over the course of many years. There are some who even liken it to our own moon because of how the craters look and how numerous they are. The other big thing about Mercury is that it's really hot there, and cold there as well, so any notions of trying to colonize it or finding signs of life there from the past, like we're trying to do with Venus, is literally slim to none. Not impossible based on some scientists' measurements, but slim. The surface temperature of Mercury ranges from 100 to 700 Kelvin, minus 173 to 427 degrees Celsius, minus 280 to 800 degrees Fahrenheit at the most extreme places. The irony, though, is that while life may not live there, many scientists believe that water does have a chance of being there. How is that possible? There are spots in craters that are never exposed to sunlight, and thus there could be ice water on Mercury waiting to be found, perhaps with a certain satellite that'll be orbiting the planet in a few years. Regardless, what's been going on with Mercury over the last few decades is that we've been getting closer and closer to it in order to figure out the finer details of the planet. Though it may be the smallest planet in our solar system, sorry Pluto, it's still full of mysteries and questions that need to be answered. And if we can't go there personally, we'll settle for machines going and doing the work for us, whatever it takes to get the answers, right? Real Images of What NASA Discovered on Venus Right now, the two planets getting the most attention in our evening sky are the gas giants of the solar system. Saturn, which through even a small telescope, boasts a spectacular system of rings, and Jupiter, which features a large disk crossed by gaseous bands and a retinue of four bright satellites that change their positions relative to each other from hour to hour and night to night. Both planets are readily visible in the southwestern evening sky soon after nightfall. And yet both these behemoths are far inferior in brightness to the brightest planet in the sky, Venus. That's right, our sister planet is so bright right now that depending on where you are in the world, you can see it before the sun sets. As Venus travels around the sun inside Earth's orbit, it alternates regularly from evening to morning sky and back, spending about 9.5 months as an evening star and about the same length of time as a morning star. This dual identity is actually a deep part of its history and discovery, because due to how Venus was perceived in the sky, the Greeks thought that it wasn't a planet, but two different stars. It wasn't until Pythagoras that we realized that they were actually the same thing, and not a star, but a planet. And once Galileo got time to observe the planet, he further confirmed what it was and helped displace the very much held belief that Earth was the center of our universe. Definitely not. Now that we've honestly gotten the chance to observe Venus more with modern technology, what are some of the things that we've honestly found on the planet? A big thing is that of craters. One of the more imposing ones that people can't help but take a look at is the Mead Crater. This impact crater is so large that it has a diameter of 168 miles. But even though we know that much of what you see was made because of a large asteroid impacting the surface, that doesn't mean that everything is solved. Because, as certain pictures show, there is a bright coloration on the impact site that may have a different origin than originally perceived. The two likely options are that there was lava that hardened within the crater, possibly from the impact of the asteroid. Or when the asteroid hit, it was able to kick up a lot of particulate matter that fell down into the crater, and thus because some of these bright areas that we see now. Hence why we need to further study Venus, so we can figure out more about these craters, their origin, why they are the way they are, and so on. When you think about Earth, it has many things that can shape the land, and one of them is volcanoes. They literally create islands when they erupt out of the ocean, and they can cause widespread destruction when they're erupting above the waters, like with Pompeii or Montana. Yet did you know that Venus has a lot of volcanoes as well? to the extent that there are apparently just as many volcanoes on Venus as there is on Earth. What's more, it helped make the planet what it is today. Much of the Venusian surface appears to have been shaped by volcanic activity in some way, shape, or form. Venus has several times as many volcanoes as Earth, and it has 167 large volcanoes that are over 100 kilometers or 62 miles across. The only volcanic complex of this size on Earth is the Big Island of Hawaii, 154. 
This is not because Venus is more volcanically active than Earth, but because its crust is older. Earth's oceanic crust is continually recycled by subduction at the boundaries of tectonic plates and has an average age of about 100 million years, whereas the Venusian surface is estimated to be 300 to 600 million years old. The volcanic activity is also believed to be a major reason that the atmosphere is what it is today. Furthermore, unlike Earth, there is no water to hide the volcanoes. Many of Earth's volcanoes are underground, and as a result of that, they aren't fully noticed until they erupt and spring out of the water to create islands like Hawaii and others. But on Venus, they're just there, and there are plenty of pictures showcasing these volcanoes and their impressive size. Oh, and the biggest volcano on Venus? It has a height of being 5 miles above the surface. What's more, it's still said to be incredibly active. Imagine if that thing blew up on Venus and we were able to watch it. That would be quite a sight indeed. Before we continue on with what we found on Venus, be sure to like or dislike the video so that we can make the best content we can for you, the viewer. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel. One of the biggest questions that have been put out about our sister planet is the question of life. For example, modeling studies have suggested that ancient Venus had big oceans and a clement climate that might have persisted for several billion years. Then obviously the greenhouse effect took over and roasted the planet to the point where everything boiled and life on the planet became impossible to have and sustain. However, now some people are saying that this wasn't an option at all for the planet. A study was published in October and it said that Venus had always been too hot in order to not just have water but to have life of any kind. Scientists led by Martin Turbot, a postdoctoral researcher at the Geneva Astronomical Observatory in Switzerland, simulated the climate of ancient Venus using a new model, and they came up with very different results than what was put out before by others. According to them, the cloud cover on Venus during its early days was very limited, and just as bad, the ones that they did have didn't bounce away any of the sunlight that was literally beaming down on them. As such, these clouds were actually helping warm the planet. And when they did that, they helped build up the greenhouse effect to a great degree, thus ensuring the planet would roast in no time flat. If the authors are correct, Venus was always a hellhole, astronomers James Casting and Chester Harmon said on the matter. The goal now is for the teams of astronomers to go and look at the land masses of Venus itself and determine what the true ancient climate of the place was. On our planet, such rocks form by metamorphic processes, in which minerals change form without melting, that occur in the presence of liquid water, Casting and Harmon wrote. If the tesserae turn out instead to be basaltic like normal seafloor on Earth, liquid water would not have been needed to generate them, further supporting Turbin and colleagues' hypothesis. The new study also found that Earth would likely have taken the Venusian route if the sun had been a bit brighter long ago. A young sun with 92% of the current brightness rather than 70% would probably have consigned our planet to hothouse status, according to the model developed by Turbot and his team. Why does that matter? Because right now many scientists are trying to find another Class M planet for us to go and live on in the future. Their parameters, for lack of a better word, is not just to find a planet that looks like Earth, but is within the habitable zone of the nearby Sun. Not an easy thing to do for various reasons, but because of these models, just because we do find a planet like that, doesn't mean it'll be habitable, apparently. Exoplanets that orbit near the inner edge of the conventional habitable zone where liquid water can exist on a planet's surface might not actually be habitable, the duo wrote. And if that is true, then Venus might have just opened our eyes not just to the uniqueness of our own planet compared to other habitable planets out there, but it gives us a chance to go and change our parameters for future colony sites as well as ensure that we study planets thorough despite how they might appear to ensure that we don't choose the wrong planet to colonize. And if you look at the surface of Venus even further, you'll see why we don't want to make the wrong choice of planet to try and colonize. Because Venus is truly littered with impact craters that showcase just how unprotected the planet was from cosmic bombardment. For example, the Dixon Crater is 44 miles across and has a very deep hole where the projectile hit so long ago. But putting that one to shame is the Isabella Crater, which is over 100 miles in diameter, second only to the Mead Crater we talked about earlier. 
While it's true that Venus isn't likely to get bombarded like before, that doesn't mean it won't happen. That's why many are trying to learn more about these impact craters and ones like them to see how they were formed and what it might mean for the planet as a whole. Such as with one theory going around that an asteroid or similar space rock bounced off a younger Earth somehow and then collided with Venus. Given the constant shifting of the universe during the stated creation, that wouldn't be the most outlandish theory out there. But that's one of the things about Venus. There are a lot of theories out there, but few answers that truly answer the big questions. But in 2028, that is aiming to change with the Veritas probe that will be launched at Venus. After launching, Veritas will reach Venus about seven months later and enter orbit around the planet. Over the next year, it will use Venus's upper atmosphere to slow down and circularize its orbit to about 250 kilometers, roughly 155 miles, from the planet's surface to map Venus in detail for years. Veritas's radar will map Venus's entire surface at 30 meters per pixel, at least three times higher resolution than NASA's previous Venus mapper Magellan. The maps will finally help scientists understand how Venus's surface changes today and how it has transformed over tens of millions of years. Veritas will also create coarse 3D maps of Venusian landforms at 5 meters per pixel height resolution to help scientists find hints of tectonic activity. Scientists will further scan the maps for large, buried impact basins, which might have formed around 4 billion years ago when large asteroids and comets were bombarding the inner solar system. If Venus doesn't have several impact basins like other rocky worlds do, it means the planet's surface has been actively reshaped for that long. The other reason that Veritas is needed is because it'll finally be able to do deep scans on the composition of the rocks on the planet to determine if there was water on the planet, as well as reveal in full whether the planet is volcanically active. And all of this will lead to the big question that the satellite will hopefully answer in can Venus be habitable? Yes, right now it isn't, but if the Veritas and other factors help reveal it can be changed through external means, then that'll mean that we may not have to travel far to colonize a new world, but rather just go next door. And what an image that would be. Real images of what NASA discovered on Jupiter. It's not hard to see why so many people at NASA and beyond are interested in Jupiter. It's the biggest planet in our solar system. It's a massive gas giant that has all sorts of unique atmospheric content. And it has so many moons that any one of them could have major discoveries lurking within, and we wouldn't know it until we honestly did some hardcore search on them. That's why we tried to make passes at Jupiter in various ways over the years in order to not just get pictures and footage and even audio clips of the planet, but to get a better idea of how this planet works as a whole. Enter the Juno probe. It launched in 2011 and ever since has been giving NASA and others all sorts of information about Jupiter. Even now, a decade after its launch, it's still providing people with valuable data, such as with some new discoveries it made very recently. For example, if you've ever really looked at Jupiter, you'll notice the great red spot that is there for all to see. That has very much been a fascination of scientists all over, and as a result of that, Juno was sent to study it when possible and new data has revised what we think of it as. The Great Red Spot was thought to be a storm shaped as a flat pancake, according to Scott Bolton, principal investigator of NASA's Juno mission and director of the Space Science Engineering Division at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. We knew it lasted a long time, but we didn't know how deep or how it really worked. In February and July 2019, NASA's Juno spacecraft flew directly over the Great Red Spot which is about 10,000 miles or 16,000 kilometers wide, to figure out how deep the vortex extends beneath the visible cloud tops. One of the scientists on the team had this to say. The precision required to get the Great Red Spot's gravity during the July 2019 flyby is staggering. Being able to complement the microwave radiometer's finding on the depth gives us great confidence that future gravity experiments at Jupiter will yield equally intriguing results. Now, based on the data found, some new things can be said about it. A microwave radiometer on Juno gave scientists a three-dimensional look at the planet. They discovered that the Great Red Spot is between 124 miles or 200 kilometers and 311 miles, 500 kilometers deep, extending much deeper into the gas giant than expected. 
The Great Red Spot is as deep within Jupiter as the International Space Station is high above our heads, said Marzia Parisi, research scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, noted in a press conference. While the storm rages on, the size of the spot is shrinking. In 1979, it was twice Earth's diameter. Since then, the spot has shrunk by at least a third, leaving many to wonder what will happen as time goes on. Will it continue to shrink? Will it suddenly grow back up in size? It's hard to say, but what we do know is that Juno will be keeping an eye on it and giving updates whenever it can. And that's not the only thing that it's been looking at with the planet. Five years ago, scientists used data gathered by Juno to capture photos and learn more about Jupiter's poles. Juno found the gas giant has five cyclonic storms at the South Pole in the shape of a pentagon and eight cyclonic storms at the North Pole forming an octagon. But here's where the really trippy stuff comes in. Because the storms aren't moving, they're literally rooted in place. The polar cyclone showed patterns of trying to move towards the poles, but the cyclones on top of each pole push back. This explains why the storms have remained in the same place. That's definitely not the kind of storms you'd expect to see on a planet, ones that literally push against one another and thus keep themselves locked in place. Plus, the amount of storms near the poles indicate a lot as well, further showing that we need to study what is going on at the poles and how it's affecting the rest of the planet as a whole. Before we go on to show you what else Juno has found, be sure to like or dislike the video so that we can continue to make the best content for you, the viewer. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel. And now, back to Jupiter. Now let's focus on the atmosphere, and specifically the clouds that are up there in the atmosphere, because they might be exactly what you think, nor interact the way you expect. Jupiter's clouds are embedded in the east and west jet streams, which extend 200 miles, 322 kilometers deep, said Karen Dewar, a doctoral student at the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel. When the research team followed the movement of ammonia, it revealed that it traveled in an up and down and north-south movement surrounding the jet streams. What you might not realize is that Earth has similar cells here. They're known as feral cells, and they help guide the wind and other circulation patterns for our planet. This in turn goes and helps regulate the climate of our planet in ways that helps give us a proper temperature output. But with Jupiter, they are much larger, more numerous, and more impactful as a whole. This means that the cells on Jupiter are at least 30 times deeper than the equivalent cells on Earth, Dewar said. There's a lot to dive into just with that, not the least of which is that the Juno probe is proving just how important it is to the study of Jupiter, as it's able to look beyond what many can do here on Earth and provide much more detail in regards to what is going on with the planet. Scott Bolton, the principal investigator of Juno from the Southwest Research Institute, SWRI, in San Antonio said, Previously, Juno surprised us with hints that phenomena in Jupiter's atmosphere went deeper than expected. Now we're starting to pull all these individual pieces together and getting our first real understanding of how Jupiter's beautiful and violent atmosphere works in 3D. Just to be clear, he really does mean violent, because the Great Red Spot and the storms at the poles aren't the only things that Jupiter has going on. Jupiter has both cyclones, which circulate clockwise, and anti-cyclones, which circulate counterclockwise. Juno discovered that cyclones have warmer air and lower density at the top, with cooler air and higher densities at the bottom. Anti-cyclones display the opposite characteristics, with colder air on top of warmer air. So they truly are polar opposites of one another, and that makes it all the more intriguing that Jupiter doesn't just happen, but they happen in bulk, apparently. Another reason to keep going and studying Jupiter to see what we can figure out. Sticking with what's going on in the atmosphere, let's talk about the auroras that are on Jupiter. Not surprisingly, they are very much like the ones we have here on Earth, with one major difference, of course, that being that the ones on Jupiter are much more powerful than ours. How much more powerful? Well, the ones that we know about are said to be so supercharged with power that they can go and power up all of humankind's cities for a brief period of time. That's a lot of power. The mystery goes deeper than that, though, because while we know that these auroras form on the poles of the planet, scientists aren't exactly sure how they're formed. They believe it's because of the atmospheric conditions of Jupiter and how they release supercharged particles that eventually go and collide with one another in order to create the aurora in question. 
There is definitely further study needed on these entities, especially if they might tell us even more about our own planet's auroras and how we can better examine them. But of course, it's not just the planet itself that is worthy of study, it's the moons. We finally know what the north pole of Jupiter's moon Europa looks like, from a distance at least. The image was taken from nearly 50,000 miles away while Juno was performing its primary mission to examine Jupiter's atmosphere. The view will improve next year when the spacecraft zooms only a few hundred miles above that same region, Juno principal investigator Scott Bolton revealed. This is a tantalizing example and a taste of what to come. Europa is a popular destination that has been imaged by spacecraft many times. The first close-up views were from NASA's twin Pioneer and twin Voyager spacecraft in the 1970s, revealing an icy surface scarred by cracks. Even more detail came during the Galileo mission, which orbited Jupiter and its moons between 1995 and 2003. As you can see, the Juno probe has done a lot for NASA scientists over the years, which is why it shouldn't be too surprising that they've extended the Juno probe's mission to 2025. That's another four years or so of information on Jupiter that can do wonders for the scientific community. But for some out there, they might not see the point in this. Why should we go and study Jupiter to this degree? Why do we care about the Great Red Spot or these anti-cyclones? Or what the North Pole of one of their moons looks like? Why should we care about that at all? The answer is that the more information we have about the planet, the more we can see what we can do with it in the future. The goal for humanity for a long time is to go and explore the stars and colonize other worlds and moons. And while Jupiter itself may not be a hospitable place for people to go and live, as it doesn't have a ground as far as we can tell, it does have plenty of moons, many of which have been deemed viable candidates for us to potentially land on. But given that, we'd still be very close to Jupiter. It's important to know about what the planet is like, what it's truly made of, and how its fields and atmosphere affect the nearby moons. Because if we don't know those basic things, we're going to be in serious trouble. And who wants that? Just as important, though, is the fact that the more we study this gas giant, the more we're likely to have an understanding of future gas giants, not just in our solar system, but in ones that we look at in space. Knowing what we have close to us is vital as we expand our gaze and reach and locate other gas giants, because that means we'll have a basis of what we think is out there, and then can alter and fine-tune our thoughts as we go on. Plus, it's fun. The Juno probe is literally being our eyes and ears out in space, and if it wasn't for that probe, we wouldn't know half or even a quarter about Jupiter as we do now. So why go and continue studying Jupiter? The better question is... Why not?